Over the past 25 odd years now, PlayStation has managed to build up quite the library of properties under their banner. Some of course have only been loosely attached from the start, some sadly disappeared over time, and some have stuck around to become flagship franchises for them. And the Ratchet & Clank series is one that has remained one of their closest properties across multiple console generations. While the platformer mascot craze of the early 2000s may not have lasted as long as some of us would have hoped, there still proved to be many icons amongst them that have retained a steady following even in today's overstuffed climate. As mentioned in my Sly Cooper list, around this period developers were having to mix other genres with their platformers so as to avoid some of the more overused cliches that had attached themselves to the genre. And thus Insomniac Games, running off the success of the Spyro trilogy, decided, hey, let's give our new mascot a bunch of big ass guns. Ratchet & Clank certainly has a lot going for it, with just about each game providing a huge array of creative weapons and gadgets, a memorable cast, along with engaging engaging, action-packed, and often humorous adventures. To me though, while all of that was certainly fantastic, the biggest selling point for me right out the gate was simply the world, or to be more exact, the universe of Ratchet and Clank. Sure, by today's standards, some of those earlier games may not prompt much of a reaction to those who are only just now beginning to integrate themselves into today's gaming options, but for the time, there was just so much colour and detail put into their many locations that they had me practically drooling over them when I was a kid. And Today, my friends, we're going to be looking over the many planets the duo have explored and find out which of them still remain out of this world and which of them maybe don't need saving right away at least. Now some of you may have noticed based on the title that I'm only going to be focusing strictly on the first three games to feature our two heroes. Why? Come on now, do I really need to explain? But why, you may follow up with, do I not at least include Deadlock slash Gladiator so as to complete the original PS2 lineup? Well, considering the worlds in that game don't exactly allow for any exploration and give little backstory outside of a few lines, I figured it would be no big loss and make my job significantly easier. In terms of the levels inside the trilogy, I'll be admitting, we can cross off the spaceship missions from the second game for obvious reasons, the Starship Phoenix, as it really just acts as a hub for the most part, and the reuses of Realgar and Iridia from the third game due to them only being utilised for a few Galactic Ranger based missions that would very likely have just ended up near the bottom anyways. This leaves us with 18 included in the first game, 17 for Going Commando, and 15 for Up Your Arsenal, leaving us with a massive 50 planets for us to cover. So don't be too surprised if I don't cover every significant detail to be found in them. And before any of you think about being smart asses, yes, I know that some of these are in fact space stations or ships and not in fact planets. One last piece of context I felt worth mentioning before some of you noticed for yourselves is that unlike with previous worst of best topics where I felt there was a fine-ish balance of good with each game, this time however you may start to notice a slight tilt away from one game so don't be too shocked noticing some of my thoughts on said game seeping through more than usual. If you do want a more in-depth analysis on these games you can find out more by checking out this video on the first few games that I put out a good couple of years ago. Just ignore the parts where some guy who sounds like me shows up on camera. That guy is the worst, trust me. Anywho, let us begin. Number 50. Marcadia. I will admit that it's hard for me to fully convey why this level in particular rubs me the wrong way, but there is just such a lack of joy to be found throughout my time spent here. The colour palette feels bland and lifeless, the sea design fails to stick out when compared to others from the series, the ranger missions are repetitive on account of the basic map we're fighting on, and the refractor section can barely be called a puzzle. Every time I revisit this location, I just feel like my brain is set to autopilot until it's over and done with. Number 49, Drex Fleet. Honestly, I think this level is here second to last, mostly due to the poorly constructed stealth mechanics used throughout, not to mention our reason for being here, feeling pretty forced when you think about it. Sure, it has its moments like walking outside the ship, piloting the jet fighter one last time, and trying to beat the clock underwater, but comparatively, I think they were done much better in previous levels to this. Number 48, Hollow Star Studios. Ok let's get this out of the way first, having to act out the movie while playing as Clank is pretty neat and uh, um, 
yeah, that, that that's that's about it. Look, this level should have been one of the series' highlights of us getting a better idea of how the entertainment industry operates in the Ratchet and Clank universe, but besides a few uninspired sets and some new tougher enemies, it just ends up as a hugely missed opportunity. Number 47, Kortu. Visually wise, this planet can be a little drab, and as I've established, I'm really not a fan of this game's stealth sections. That being said, I'm sure I'm not the only one who was giddy over getting to pilot Giant Clank for the first time and duke it out with other robots, even if it wasn't that challenging. Number 46, Obani. I'm not the only one who keeps forgetting that this level exists, right? The first half that sees us bouncing lasers around the moon is probably the only noteworthy time when using the refractor, outside of occasionally using it for combat. Other than the asteroid ring that can be jumped on, it's very artistically mute overall. Things do get better with the second moon, however, with its metal plant life, that could be a very clever way as to hint as to what's to come. Unfortunately, there's little else here to get us to stop and smell the steel roses. Number 45. Siberius. Artistically, it sure would have been nice to have seen a bit more effort put into differentiating this planet from Hoven, but don't worry, design-wise, it's uh, easily one of the weakest. Besides a few secrets, there's nothing at the start, the convoy chase is good, I guess, but the boss fight with the thief is way too easy for what's been built up since the game's intro. Not to judge, but I would truly be shocked if you can't get this done on your first try. Number 44. Zeldrin Spaceport. There's definitely one of those blink and you'll miss it levels as you can easily skip out on the real meat of it just by walking a few steps towards the story focused stuff right after you land. And the location itself certainly tries to play around with the humour of the station's loose rules over its intercom and the music is one of the better tracks from the third game. Other than that, I, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've already forgotten about this level. Number 43. Snivelak. I'm sure I'm not the only one who got stuck on the difficulty spike for ages here, am I? Rushing through this one is not much of an option thanks to tons of enemies spawning in, not to mention having to deal with tanks and choppers as well. I guess it does give players a real challenge before the final act kicks in, but unfortunately the boss fight really ends up dragging any good will it had down, with it easily being one of the slowest boss fights I've ever come up against in my life. Number 42. Koros. God, I wish this level had so much more to it. While I do like the more openness provided to help with the multiple enemies in your way, and it is one of the more detailed locations in the third game at least, it still comes off feeling empty and almost pointless by the end. Frankly, I would have just removed this whole level and focused on adding more to the final one right after. Number 41, Kirkwin. Okay, so this plan is going to be showing up again later down the list, so I'll be very brief here. Other than a few nostalgic callbacks, there's very little to offer here with the exception of the energy boost the enemies get, the ranger missions that are pants easy to beat this time, and the boss that humorously fell off the train we were fighting on while I was recording. Number 40, Aquatos. On paper, there's a lot of things here I should like. We get both a unique setting, along with infiltrating a bad guy's lair without having to go in guns blazing, but sadly, we get to spend most of our time walking through the most charming of places, the sewers. The infiltration section is alright, but considering all the spy movie references used in this game, it would have been nice to have seen them get a little creative here. The sewer crystals might be the worst the material collecting found in the series yet for how repetitive and drab the environment feels, not to mention having to put up with tubes getting blocked off by King Amoeboids not spawning in. Number 39. Obani Draco. Visually wise, this level does a fine job, and as boss fights go, our one with Courtney is surprisingly one of the few comedic fights we get from the series. It's too bad the journey getting to said boss fight is pants easy, even if it does have a very unique look to it all. Personally, I would have just linked up all three Obani moons together, but who knows, maybe loading in three separate maps proved to be too much of a challenge. Number 38. Grelbin. I don't know why, but something here feels missing to me. Outside of the wildlife and the caves with the glider, there's just very little personality or life felt here. Collecting the moon rocks, which takes up the majority of the level, just isn't as fun as it is on Tabora with the crystals. Mostly due to the lack of energetic music, not to mention the constant appearance of yetis overwhelming you every five seconds. Number 37. Mylon. 
As final levels go, this one feels a little anticlimactic, but does have some alright points to it. What few gadgets we have are implemented here and there, except for the warp pad. Though the fights can feel too cramped, the final fight with Nefarious is great in how it forces you to really move about with multiple phases to it, and is debatably the best boss fight in the trilogy, so long as we're leaving out the last few minutes. Number 36. Aronos. A memorable key point in the second game's narrative, even if it only really serves as a slight speed bump in our hero's journey. Having the duo split up so as to have the two help each other move forward certainly made the escape more interesting, but then the few times you get to fight horizontally, that's about it. Seeing as the ship we're on is clearly the same one that we started the second game with, having us move through or even just catching glimpses of our first visit would have helped out a lot I think. On an unrelated note, anyone notice this habit of platformers sending our heroes to jail temporarily? Number 35, Gaspar. It's admittedly hard for me to not think about the much improved version of this level from the 2016 remake nowadays, but I guess there are still some pros to be found in the original. While the main path to obtain the pilot's helmet is alright with you getting to man turrets and all, the real highlight to me comes from trying to blow up these refueling bombers, even if all we get for our effort is just a skill point and a gold bolt. Number 34, Annihilation Nation. I'll give this arena level this, I'm glad this time around we're now able to easily jump to the challenge the next screen without having a long ass taxi ride getting in the way. But with that being said, the lack of any exploration can make this location a little too enclosed for my liking. There's a good bit of platforming used in the course challenges, though it certainly would have been nice to have had an extra long one thrown in towards the end. The arena battles sadly do little to step up from the cage matches on Joba, along with the boss fights just not being as challenging or as memorable this time around. Number 33, Bolden. This is a hard one for me to pin down. It's one of the longest and toughest levels with many instances where you're needed to maneuver a lot so as to get around enemy cover, plus we get a challenging grind rail that takes a different turn than what we're used to. The downside to this level, however, is that its color and lighting really makes this place feel drab and lifeless to the point I question if anyone has lived here in years. Had we got on a setting along the lines of Blackwater City along with getting to see a few ships in the air or something with a bit of motion to it, then this level could have been one of the greatest. Number 32, Maktar Resort. Though the arena is the clear highlight to this level, there's thankfully some decent effort put into making this location feel like this massive entertainment hub. A weird complaint, but I wish they could have found a way to avoid using the limo along the main path to the arena, as it kind of just feels like they didn't know how to link things up. I can only say I'm a fan out of one out of the two bosses from the arena, and the mission to take out the jamming ray, though neat that we get to move around a spherical map, has never been as action packed as I'd like it to be. Maybe it's the music or lack of tension, I don't know. Number 31, Eudora. Odd that the bulk of this level is dedicated to obtaining an optional weapon rather than your main objective, but at the very least, it is a memorable one and we are given a lot of enemy variety to this location. Kinda feels like though, there should have been something at the end though to help us stop with the whole deforesting thing at least. Number 30, Feldin. Cautious is the word that I think best describes how to play this level. Unless you came packing and know how to work with the game's stiff control so as to dodge incoming enemy fire, probably best to stick to firing from afar. Even then, there are one or two dodgy platforming moments and the lighting and music don't exactly inspire the best of confidence at times. However, getting to plow through an army of the enemies that we just had to put up with was most definitely a satisfying reward, even if it was short-lived. As for the final boss, it's not bad, I guess. I've always liked boss fights that include weapons and equipment that mimic our own, I just wish the setting to our final showdown had a bit more colour put into it. Also, did our heroes really need to blow up the planet that so many had died over? Number 29, Tyrannosis. Though I feel this level didn't start off the best, it quickly picks up thanks to letting you drive the turbo slider for a bit and giving you the freedom to pick which gun turret to take out in which order. The boss fight with the Mama Tyranoid can be very cinematic and tense at times, and the Galactic Ranger missions are certainly the most challenging of the game. Number 28, Yadil. 
There was a lot of potential here to show us the real dark side of Megacorp, and when it comes to the presentation at the start, they nailed it. But when we get inside, it's still good, just not as much as I would have hoped. Like with all final levels, we get some last minute time with the majority of the gadgets we've accumulated, though I wish we had gotten one last outing for the glider and the levitator. The fight with the experiment is not bad, but not especially hard given you've got decent armor on you. While he may look fierce, I think you have more reason to be wary of the other enemies involved in the fight. Though I guess props to working in the tractor beam near the end, even if it does hardly any damage. Number 27. Tudano. I really enjoy this little tour guide bit at the start, just for the sake of comedy and a few skill points. We actually get a few decent puzzles this time with a tractor beam that ends up leading to a pretty handy weapon for the rest of the game. Outside of the minefield, however, the rest of the facility is kind of bland indoors, with us having to deal with constantly spawning in enemies, along with limited space to move around in. Number 26. Auxon. One of the most interesting levels, both in how it's designed as well as how it gives us some insight into the Blarg civilization and how badly they need some home improvement done on the place. While the Clang section overstays its welcome, we do get to have some more fun with the gadge bots, at least when their deaths don't force you to backtrack that much. The second half of Ratchet back in play can be pretty tough, especially when you're being ganged up on with little to no room to fight, making running away really your only option at times. Number 25. Brand Asteroid Belt. First off, it was nice to be able to use the warp pad for the mere two times it was utilised in the entire game. The Cork security bots will certainly be a handful to overcome with their quick rate of fire and thick layer of armour, not to mention having to deal with the occasional icy surfaces and laser turrets at the same time. I only wish the clank section at the end could have maybe been spruced up a bit. Number 24. Endarko. It's hard to not make comparisons between this level and Metropolis given their artistic similarities and early inclusion into their respective games. Sadly, not everything works out for the best here, with things really slowing down when controlling the cranes, along with the incredibly short boss fight that I managed to beat in less than 30 seconds. Still, you can't say they didn't try Megopolis. I really like how the enemies are designed to be street cleaners, and having us to get to use the slingshot while grinding was awesome, and I don't know why they don't ever do this ever again. Speaking of throwing away ideas, let's give a round of applause to good old lift a bot for his first and also final appearance in the series. Number 23. Hoven. As ice theme planets go, this one managed to come out on top for me, but that's still not saying much. While the puzzle to raise the water is practically nothing, and the climb to stop the ship is surprisingly short, it's the tricky path up to the rare Itanium that makes up for it greatly in my opinion. Number 22. Umbris. As the first single objective based level in the series, this location does a fine job as the transition point to the second act, with a pretty intimidating and grimy atmosphere, all thanks to its turrets, mines, sharks, and a limited supply of barbed wire. It's a shame the boss fight is pretty standard, even for the first game in its rather rough controls. Number 21 Dobbo while it's not much of a problem nowadays for me to get through this level, back in my younger years it really took its toll on me thanks to its aggressive enemies and limited room for manoeuvring. The more greyish green colour palette outside, while not the most appealing, does help in us better understanding Megacorp more I feel. Both getting to control the much improved giant clank and having us use the glider back through the hallway we just fought our way through were good rewards for all the effort we put in. Also this joke will always be one of my favourites. What? Now even the computers are charging us? Number 20. Pokotaru. Certainly one of the most colourful locations, especially when contrasted with the last few planets that came right before it. While it comes off as being very explorative, there's certainly not much to discover, save for a hidden path to a gold bolt. Getting to actually take out the Blarg ships with a jet fighter was a good way to conclude the level, and, unlike on Eudora, we get to feel like we actually did something this time to save the planet. Number 19. Notak. Like with Darko, this level at first glance can feel a little bit like they copied too much from the previous game, in this case Rilgar, but the attention to detail on the streets and buildings, especially within the shopping district, do help to overlook this comparison. That being said, I do wish the main path had a bit more put into it, and while I do like using the Furminator in the factory, does someone want to explain to me why alien shocks are necessary in the chemical factory? Number 18. Aridia. The use of lighting and an easy music here really helps in creating a cool yet cautious environment compared to the more bustling and vibrant settings surrounding the start of the first game. The soundtrack extermination is good training against multiple smaller enemies and the slingshot path allows for players to properly become acquainted with the long running gadgets. 
Number 17. Drax. It certainly would have been nice if more planets in the third game were, you know, designed with optional paths in mind, but c'est la vie, I guess. The roof when infiltrating the base can be a bit intimidating thanks to multiple hordes of enemies ganging up on you, and the fight with the warship is there to offer you a more platforming focused alternative. Number 16. Novalis. The first planet to let you stretch your legs. There's some iconic sites with a level smartly designed to have one goal focused mostly on combat while the other focused mainly on platforming. Plus lying down that pipe at the end beats a teleporter any day of the week. Number 15. Zeldrin. The Zell wasn't too bad when it comes to originality and just the sheer scale to it, with the crash ship wreckage allowing for some neat combat opportunities like climbing up the slanted tower near the end. It's just a shame that one of the third game's more interesting levels is over and done with before we know it. Number 14. Calibo 3. Having Gatchatron be there throughout our journey and then getting the opportunity to have a much closer look at the almost faceless conglomerate was a smart way to explore the corporate side of the Ratchet & Clank universe. Not only does it feel like they sterilise the place every half an hour, but the design and setting just comes off as one of the galaxy's most advanced planets. I mean look, they even have travelators, freaking travelators guys. The jetboarding's alright, though I do prefer Blackwater's course more, but the grind rail here is definitely a highlight of the game with its many trams zooming past us that look to be heading straight for the ocean floor considering the lack of railing they're running on. Number 13. Tabora. Surprising in how we have so many snow theme levels throughout the series, yet if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the only desert theme levels we get into a crack in time. The opening with the cave is decently designed, with the walls decorated in god knows what, and while the path to the glider is pretty short, I do like what they do with the Furminator here. The desert area itself is very much the best of the collectible zones from the trilogy, with it being the most open, having a decent lineup of enemies, and just comes off as more appealing. Number 12. Jobba. A level that I'm sure many of us ended up constantly returning to. The climb to reach the stadium is very well structured with manned gun turrets in your way along with having to ascend a huge wall while jumping over obstacles. That said, having to buy the levitator for a steep price right at the end was a low blow I must say. The arena steps things up a notch for Maktar with bigger threats, not to mention the sweet cage matches that really push your skills at strafing. As for the bike races, they're good, just not great like the first. Number 11. Jamlik Base. One of the most intimidating levels for sure with not just tons of enemies but an eerie track and intense colour palette to go with it. Throughout you'll be needing to look out for ways to get around force field and gun turrets along with having to really rely heavily on your more rocket based weapons. The pressure certainly keeps rising with magna boot walkways, manned turrets, rocket firing ships, not to mention a final room filled with an army of foes chasing after you. As for the fight with Quark, it's alright, not amazing, but certainly an upgrade from the previous two boss fights used in the game. Number 10, Smog. Man, this level really knows how to make a location feel massive and it all comes down to the skybox that managed to work all the angles along with the use of space so as to allow us to easily focus on the ships and structures in the distance. Admittedly, the warehouse area can feel a little bit like they took advantage of the what, three boxes they made and just duplicated a bunch? But the levitator section just feels epic to fly this time around and leads to what might possibly be the most interesting character from the entire series. Number 9. Florana. I'll give the third game this, they knew how to start things off really well, providing a location unlike one we've ever seen before, with technology and architecture looking a lot more primitive than when used to. Even if the boss fight is a bit of an afterthought, the path of death makes up for it. I understand this level had some major chunks of content cut, but I think it still comes out as one of the game's best. Number 8. Battalia. One of the most action-packed aesthetic locations, this level knows how to amp things up for the start of the second act with tanks, air bombardments and the first real time we get to test out the grind boots. The smooth building architecture mixed with the jungle-like environment is something I've never really seen before. Not to mention the music, enemies and dreary weather really helps to emphasise the warlike setting. Number 7. Uzlar. Admittedly the music for this level is a little mismatched for a swamp but... 
by god is it epic. Props to the team for stuffing in tons of wildlife with them not only working as your enemies along both paths but also in platforming sections as well. The jump from the deadly swamp to the infested shopping outlet is also a good laugh with its cheerful music and pre-recorded messages. We also get a challenging hidden boss fight for later on in the game as well as getting to watch innocent staff members die in quite gruesome ways. Number 6 Olantis I don't know what the general consensus is to sections of games that remove a key part of your equipment, but I think it works here for just one level, reminding us of just how much of a part Clank plays in our adventure. Gorda City makes for a nice contrast to the much sunnier and less blown up metropolis, and is a stark reminder of how far Drek is willing to go to get what he wants. There are lots of paths to take, even if only one of them is needed to progress the story, with tons of obstacles like icy floors, strong winds, hovering spotlights and turrets, twisted magnet boot walkways, along with a grind well with enemies chasing you down at this time. There's also just a lot of fun to be had from the slingshot course that shows up eventually. You know, someone at Insomniac should really see about trying to perfect this mechanic. Could come in handy for a game or two years down the line. Number 5 Blog Tactical Research Station not only is this location just cool to be walking around in, but I love how it manages to have each of its three paths feel unique and show us the research station from every angle. The clan platforming might be a little rough on some bits, but the journey through the experiment labs more than makes up for it. Every time I replay this game and get to this level, I get chills every time I see that opening shot and hear that subtle, creepy, yet adventurous music play. Number 4 Realgar so let's get this out of the way first, this level's music is just awesome in every way. Finding ways to set the enemies on one another is great, the sewer rush is challenging in the good way, and the hoverboard race, while not technically a requirement to beat in order to continue, is still a fun activity, plus how else are you going to pay for that rhino without those infinite boxes? Number 3 Damozel Easily one of the best levels to end out the last few moments of a game with. There's the flashy optional giant clank boss fight, epic grind well that manages to throw just about everything at you, not to mention a cute reference to that other series that I also happen to really enjoy. The main path has more than a few great moments with us moving all across the city, fighting in residential areas, banks, a supermarket, all with the proto pets running about and duplicating in seconds, showing us how just like with Atlantis that the stakes have never been higher than they are until now. Oh, and also there's this guy at the end whose whole concept is just ridiculous and he has gone from us way too quickly. Number 2 Barlow God, I love the environmental storytelling used here. From the rundown Gadgetron structures, to the enemies that have moved in, to the mining equipment being the only mostly operational machinery around. The main path will have you up against tons of enemies at once, with the path to the Furminator throwing in a bit of platforming in with the slingshot. And then there's the hover bike races that manage to crank the exhilaration up to new heights. And number one, Kirkwin, again. Arguably the most recognisable location in the entire series with its detailed and breathtaking architecture, incredibly wide colour palette and just its overall upbeat atmosphere around every corner. Whether you're fighting through enemies towards owls, journeying up to the train station or platforming all the way to the end of the obstacle course, there is just so much going on in the city that it's no surprise that it keeps showing up all the time. And there we have it folks, can't say this was an easy one to rank up, especially when it came to those final few, but it was fun all the same. If I'm up to it and you all happen to like this video, wink wink nudge nudge, I may try my hand at doing a similar list with the mainline PS3 Ratchet and Clank games and maybe even one for the upcoming Rift Apart later this year. Thank you all again for all your love and support and as always, till next time.